hurt? Uh, are you hurt? People need to know that the shaking is not over. We'll get hit again. And it's going to be a bigger monster. Humans seem to have this simultaneous fascination with and disbelief in disasters. There are movies about pandemics, fires, animal attacks, and in the clip you just heard, earthquakes. In the movie San Andreas, an earthquake devastates Los Angeles and San Francisco. I like how the seismologist refers to the earthquake as a monster, because a monster is something that we are afraid of, but we also don't truly believe in. Most of us don't monster-proof our houses. And it's hard to know sometimes what are the real monsters that we need to be preparing for and what are the unrealistic fantasies. In this season of the podcast, we're looking at how engineering can help us prepare for natural disasters. As you might have guessed, today our topic is earthquakes. And I'm your host, Rachel Robertson. From the College of Engineering at Oregon State University, this is Engineering Out Loud. Today, we'll hear from Ben Mason, Associate Professor of Civil and Construction Engineering, who faces the earthquake monster in his daily work. He's traveled the world doing post-earthquake reconnaissance. I talked to him recently on my sun porch, where we are recording our podcast interviews in the open air. So you might hear the occasional bird in the background. He told me about his first reconnaissance trip in 2011 after a 9.0 magnitude earthquake in Japan, when the devastating impact of earthquakes became painfully real to him. We went up to the Sendai Plain in northeast Japan, and that's where the tsunami uh, came on shore, maybe with the most vigor. And we saw an entire village just washed away to its foundations. And the government had come in and basically stacked up all the debris and these large mounds. And so you see these mounds that are probably like five, six stories high of just debris. And you see these hobby horses and like soccer balls, the, the, the components of people's lives that are uh, just sitting there, you know, and... And that was heavy, and I, you know, I actually vomited because it was so heavy for me. And I think that was that was also um, a turning moment for me in realizing, like, okay, this is a this is a very human endeavor. Our job here is to focus on on the science, of of course, but you can't decouple the science that you're doing from. Uh, from the home human component. The human component is particularly relevant for those of us living in Oregon, where scientists are predicting a 9.0 magnitude earthquake caused by the Cascadia subduction zone. And we'll get back to the human component, but first, let's talk about the science. In general, during earthquake shaking, one thing that can happen if you have, in particular, sandy soils that are fully saturated with water, is during the earthquake shaking, those sandy soils can lose all of their strength, lose all of their ability to, say, hold up a structure or a bridge, and uh, they start behaving like a fluid or like a liquid, and that's why we call that, that process liquefaction. So we went to places where we knew liquefaction was happening, and then we performed these uh, geophysical techniques. And that again, the point of that is to bring those back and then allow our community to improve our current understanding and analysis techniques for predicting when liquefaction is going to occur during future earthquakes. So Japan was Ben's first trip. Since then, he's been to Napa, California, where conditions were very similar to what we might see here in Oregon. He also spent two years going back and forth to Nepal. More recently, he was the team leader for a group called the Geoengineering Extreme Events Reconnaissance Association, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. So we went to Indonesia in 2018 following the damaging earthquake, as well as tsunami that occurred there. 
In that particular case, we examined three very large flow slides. So a flow slide is when the soil completely loses its strength, very similar to the liquefaction phenomenon I explained earlier, and then uh, rapidly flows downhill. And so what was interesting in this case is that these flow slides occurred on not very steep slopes. And so we had a tremendous opportunity to learn about that phenomenon with, of course, the hope that what we're going to take away from it is going to help save lives in the future when similar types of phenomenon occur. One of the techniques Ben uses to collect data involves some sensors in the ground called geophones and a sledgehammer. It sounds odd, but it's a technique that the petroleum industry uses that scientists have adapted for earthquake reconnaissance. All the geophones do is they measure the velocity of the ground, how quick the ground's moving. And they, they usually measure that velocity, and we, we call it three components, but it's, it's just three directions. And so you just think about like up and down, and then two horizontal directions that are perpendicular to each other. And so we usually use an array of them or a line of them. So we might use 10 of those geophones in a line, and maybe they're spaced one meter apart, something like that. And then you're going to, some, some distance away from that, you're going to put a big steel plate on the ground and you're going to hit it with the sledgehammer. And what that does is you're, you're kind of, you're trying to replicate what an earthquake is going to do by smacking that steel plate with the sledgehammer. You're sending the waves into the ground and then they're going to make their way through the ground and they're going to meet different layers of soil and as they meet those different layers they're going to bounce back up and come to the surface and it's going to be this very complicated picture of how the waves go into the ground and how they ultimately come back up but with those little velocity sensors or geophones that's exactly what we're measuring we're measuring the velocity of the wave as it comes back up and we're also measuring the time that it takes after I strike that, that plate with the sledgehammer. And from those pieces of information, we can use what's called an inverse technique and work backwards to estimate how the soil must be layered in the ground. Ben is also using newer techniques such as remote sensing technologies. In Indonesia, we brought a couple of drones over with us with very high megapixel cameras and we're able to program in flight paths so that they would stop on certain spots and take high quality imagery. And we're also able to put out these very sensitive GPS sensors, leave them running for a couple hours. We left them running at very known locations with targets. And so as the drone flies over, it images those targets, and then from the GPS data, you know exactly where on Earth you're located, as well as the elevation. And so from all of that information, we're able to piece together very accurate, they're called digital elevation maps or digital elevation models. And so it's a very accurate representation of the ground surface. And uh, you can do it for buildings. And we have a number of colleagues at, at OSU, uh, for instance, Michael Olson, who do this type of work. Ultimately, what we're trying to do in earthquake engineering, though, is, is measure how things move. And so I think uh, we're, we're either taking displacement measurements or velocity measurements, as I've described before, or even in some case, uh, acceleration measurements. Okay, cool. And so if you understand how the earth is going to move, you can predict what will happen to buildings and then try to um, engineer things in a way so that they are less impacted. Is that correct? You would have gotten an A in my geotechnical earthquake engineering class. I mean, if, if there was a better, there's not a better summary. There's nothing more important to us than understanding how the ground's going to move during an earthquake at the specific location 
of wherever our building, bridge, earth dam, pipeline, what have you, is located. If we know how the ground's going to move, and in other words, how it's going to displace, what its velocity, what its acceleration is going to be, we can now predict how the structure is going to respond. So the maybe the holy grail for this work in Oregon now, because we haven't had a major Cascadia earthquake since 1700, is trying to predict how the ground is going to move throughout the Willamette Valley during the next earthquake. And so if I was going to make a plea for a state putting resources into science, that would be one of my big pleas is let's put money into that. And certainly we have colleagues at OSU. I've got a lot of colleagues at the USGS that are working on, on this problem, but it's a hard problem. But if we get it right, or if we get it anywhere near right, it's going to pay dividends in terms of making our infrastructure uh, safer. To reach that goal, Ben discovered that his data collection improved if he did one simple thing, talk to the people who live there. My first reconnaissance trip, I thought it was just all about uh, you go in, here's the scientific objective, you do the work, and you get out. What I realized very quickly is that that was not the best strategy. But it's a strategy that's been employed for a long time. The first time I went to Japan, we went up to this farmer's land that has liquefied and scientists have been coming out to his land, he told us, since the 1970s to do similar types of work. Of course, the sensors and the processes have advanced over the years. And he actually said we were the first team in that entire time to talk to him. And so I gave him my Oregon State hat at the time, and he gave us a bag of persimmons as, as a trade. And so for me, though, I think the, that interaction set the tone, because even through that brief interaction, and we had the students there translating, what we realized is that we learned an incredible amount, and he pointed us to other areas where we didn't realize that liquefaction had occurred. And so maybe in some sense, I was fortunate in my first real reconnaissance experience that I also had that experience. And ever since then, I've, I've brought voice recording capability with me to the reconnaissance events to try to capture as much of the eyewitness interviews as possible. Including the step of talking to witnesses turned out to be crucial for his most recent trip to Indonesia. When we got there, we didn't have the best recordings of how the ground actually shook from seismometers. And so we talked to people about their experiences of how the ground shook. And then over talking to, say, 30 people, the, the description was very, very consistent. And that was critical for us in piecing together how these flow slides initiated and how they occurred and how they might occur again in future events. One of the things that Ben finds rewarding about his job is the opportunity to communicate with people. Part of the research he did in Nepal was providing workshops and guidance for the engineers and scientists there. More recently, he's been working to educate the local community in the Willamette Valley through op-eds and workshops for the general public, explaining the science behind earthquake hazards and guidance on how to prepare. This year, Ben has a position with the United States Geological Survey, known as the USGS, as a research civil engineer, where he hopes to expand his reach with science communication. You can read his op-eds that are linked on our webpage to learn more. But here are two main points he wants to convey. Don't have the false sense that because we're a fully developed nation that we're somehow, um, we don't have the same risk. The earthquake does not care about our economic status. And we saw a bunch of damage in Japan, who's also a fully developed nation. So I think that's one lesson. I think the other one is... Go ahead and start 
talking in your communities because right now interaction with your community members is in some ways uh, optional right you can go about your day-to-day life without interacting with any of your neighbors but during these post-disaster times that's not going to be really an option so to the extent that you can start interacting with your communities and then in particular figuring out you know for me one thing i could probably do is go around and help turn uh, gas valves off, for instance, but other folks might have uh, other skills. But this all happens naturally after one of these disasters. But I think to the point that we can educate ourselves and prepare beforehand, even when that community building and coming together does happen, it, it can be stronger. We covered all my questions. Is there anything else that you feel is important that, to add? Um, I, I think whenever the one plea I'll make is for whenever you're interested in something new that seems hard, there's maybe a, a reluctance to get involved and there's like a, a perceived barrier to get involved. You know, for instance, if if you want to play golf and you go out to the golf range and you see people who are hitting the ball 300 yards, that can be a tremendous barrier (laughs) to you wanting to start that because you know that you're not going to be able to do that. Maybe you're embarrassed that other people are watching. And so sometimes i i think that science and engineering is kind of like that for people when they're young and and one thing that as i've gotten older one thing that i would like to to shout more about is that there's large room in science and engineering for for everyone and and indeed as we move forward and think about solutions to our infrastructure problems we would be better served if, if more people are involved. One thing that I think surprises a lot of people when they do become scientists or engineers is ultimately I spend most of my days writing or talking to people. So communication, if you're a very effective communicator, you can be an exceptional scientist or engineer. And the other misconception that that comes about is it's got to be an individual pursuit. Like you've got to be great at all of these things. And I think that's that's complete nonsense, right? We should be working together and the folks who are better at communicating should do that part of it. The folks who are better at sitting down and programming and doing the math should do that part of it. And so for, for anyone listening that's maybe interested in science or engineering or has uh, kids or nieces, nephews, et cetera, you know, I just really encourage them to not think that there's a barrier up. As we move forward, I think the, in, the inclusion of more folks into this field is, is what we need. Perfect. Thank you. Good. That concludes the second episode of our season on natural disasters. Up next, we'll take on wildfires. This episode was produced by me, Rachel Robertson, with lots of help from Will Havner and the whole podcast team. Our intro music is The Ether Bunny by Eyes Closed Audio on SoundCloud, used with permission of a Creative Commons attribution license. The music and effects in this episode were also used with appropriate licenses. For more information, visit engineeringoutloud.oregonstate.edu. Okay, cool. I think we just had a bird visit us. We did. (laughs) I like birds.